Turn with me tonight to 2 Kings chapter 6. <clears throat> going to be reading 8 through 23, verses 8 through 23, 2 Kings chapter 6. When you find it, stand with me, if you will. <clears throat> I'll just give you fair warning. My nose is sore because I've been crying and snorting and snotting all week, the last several days. <clears throat> Not just this last week, but all I can say is God is good and He's faithful. <clears throat> all right, let's read. Starting in verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward them, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, This is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. <laughs> and he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, Open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes, and they looked, and there they were, inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking... He sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the vans from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you tonight. Lord, Lord, as we read your word, Lord, it is full of truth. It is full of victory. It is full of power. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us tonight through your word. Lord, just speak to us. Lord, have your will in your way. Lord, I pray that you would just steal and quiet my mind and help me just to speak what you want me to speak do what you want to do Lord tonight speak to us Lord again help us to put everything out of our minds our thoughts the day's events and help us just focus right now on what you have for us to receive what you have for us at this moment may your will be done in every part of it may you be glorified not me not anyone else you and you alone. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we have these two nations, Aram and Israel, are at war. And every time the king of Aram makes his plans to attack or sneak up on the Israelites, those plans are being told to the king of Israel. And the Israelites are getting the upper hand every time. If you as the king of Aram, would that tick you off just a little bit? Would that not get under your skin just a little bit? As you can imagine, he was furious at this and was trying to figure out how the Israelites know where they are every time. So in his mind, he's thinking that it's one of his own. 
It's an inside job, right? That would just sort of make sense, wouldn't it, Tony? Okay. So verse 11 through 14 says this. This enraged the king of Aram. He, sent, he summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? In other words, there's a traitor in our midst. Who is it? He's calling them out. Tell me who it is. He thinks it's one of his own. And I love the response that he gets. None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Well, wouldn't that just give you fuzzies all over? <laughs> I don't think he had warm fuzzies whenever he heard that. I think that actually made him a little bit more nervous and probably fired him up that much more. You see, it was God giving Elisha the battle plans for the Arameans every time the king made plans. And Elisha is telling the king of Israel, then they get the victory. God was already working. Nobody was in their midst doing it. It was God doing it the whole time. So the king of Aram finds Elisha and sets out to end this charade. Remember, he sends out his bands to go find where he's at, and they said that he was in Dotham. And so that's where we find him at. And we find Elisha and his servant are getting up. They're getting their folders on the coffee pot, frying the bacon, got the biscuits in the oven, getting ready to start their day. All right? And I can imagine the servant walks out the door, has this little cup of coffee in his hand, walks out, and he looks up. And when he looks up, he sees all this army. And I say he just probably just dropped his little couple of folders right then and there, don't you think? I think the jaw just hit the floor. You ever just like you ever just want to be a fly on the wall and just you want to see like how people react certain times? I would love to have seen his facial expression at that very moment. Have you ever had that kind of facial expression? I think we might have. <clears throat> I can just imagine what he thought. In verse 15 it says, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. I don't know why it doesn't have, instead of a question mark, an exclamation mark, but it says, Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? How many times have those words ever come out of your mouth? Hmm? Maybe even just this past week, how many times did they come out of your mouth? Have you ever had a problem, a situation that popped up in the midst of your oh so happy fun day and something come up and happened and then it just sort of stopped you cold and you just said, oh my, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I just found out that my tires are going to cost $800. Lord, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> I just found out that I got to do a car repair. It's going to be $1,500. What am I going to do? I just found out I didn't get the news I wanted to get from my test at the doctor. Lord, what are we going to do? But don't you wish you had somebody like Elisha to come up beside of you and his response? And he says, verse 16, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Don't you wish you had somebody like, on, like a paid staff member, maybe? You know, some, sometimes I like to, I told Michelle, so I love to have like a paid secretary just to follow me sometimes and do stuff and just remind me of different things, right? And she's looking at me like, no, you're not. <laughs> But I wish I had, you know, sometimes you wish you had somebody that would just come up alongside you and say, don't be afraid, Carla. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Judy, don't you wish you had somebody come up alongside you and said, don't be afraid, Judy. Greater is the one with us than the one who is with them. Matt, don't you wish you had somebody come up alongside you and say, don't be afraid, Matt. Stronger, mightier, 
more awesome, more powerful is the one that is with you than is the one who comes against you. Wouldn't that be great if you had somebody come up along like right at the right time and say those things to you? Again, I would have loved to have seen the look on the servant's face whenever Elisha told him that because the servant is looking and he knows what he sees. He's probably looking at Elisha and looking at his coffee cup and saying, what are you drinking? But then Elisha went a step further. He didn't just stop at trying to encourage his servant with words. But then he prayed that his servant might see what he was seeing. See, because Elisha seen something totally different. Right? It says, verse 17, And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Hmm. Wouldn't that have been neat? Elisha's seen it. And there's times I wondered, I thought, well, why did Elisha see it and the servant not see it? Well, number one, what God tells me is that Elisha was full of the Spirit. He was full of God. God was showing him things that other people couldn't see. You ever been there? Has God revealed something to you that he hasn't shown somebody else? You've seen it. You know it. You feel it. It's in your bones. It's in your soul. You know it. God's revealed it to you. But other people, maybe even a family member, maybe even be a spouse, your best friend or whatever, and they look at you and say, what's wrong with you? What are you on? I don't, I don't get that. You ever been there? Well, did you ever pray that it would be revealed to them like it's revealed to you? Have we done that? I haven't done that enough. <laughs> but at that moment, he's seen it. He's seen it with his own eyes. He's seen the evidence for himself. Right? In that very moment, his servant seen the evidence of what was taking place. It was an oh boy kind of moment, right? If we could all just seen and experience what he's seen in that moment. <clears throat> so here in the last little bit, there's been things happening, been things stirring in, in within me, and makes me question, Lord, why you know why is this happening, or why is this person dealing with this, or you know different things and. And, you know, of course, we don't have all the answers. We know that, right? I was listening to, not Caleb, what is it? Air One. Air One, yeah. <clears throat> At work, when I was working, doing design work and different things, and, and I was listening, and there was an artist that they'd done, like, a little short little interview with or whatever, and they asked him something to the fact of, how do you know God is real? How do you know he's present? How do you know he exists? And his answer was, by the evidence. By the evidence. See, I think, I think with us Christians, a lot of times there, there's two different kinds of us. There's the Elisha and there's the servant. You know, I want to ask you, which one are you tonight? Which one are you? Are you the servant? You're in the situation, you just don't see it. You hear other people talking about what God is doing, what, how he's moving, and, and you see, you know, they're saying that God's at work, and you're just like, man, I wish I could just see that. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't see it. I don't get it. Are you, are you questioning? Are you asking, oh, my, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to come out on the other side of this? Or are you the Elisha and you know God is working, you've seen the evidence, you know he's there, you can see it with your eyes that God is with you. So, as I said this morning when I testified, it's just, and my, my own son has said that he doesn't see me cry very often. <clears throat> and I think that's sort of changing, but if he could see me sometimes at work at other places, he's not with me all the time, but 
I ask God to show me that he's there working. You know what his answer was? Sort of just smacked me right in the face, Jesus. Have, do you not see the evidence? Have you not seen me there working? So I started having all these little backflashes, you know, these from the past and different things, and all these things that God has done and brought me through. And I was sitting there designing, I was sitting there working at my desk, and I just lost it. Uncontrollably, I just, just tears started flowing, I was snotting all over myself. It wasn't pretty, Jamie, it really wasn't. I didn't have any tissues right there or nothing, so I got up and I thought, Lord, if somebody comes in the door, I'm going to look like such an idiot. <laughs> so I got up and I went to the bathroom. <clears throat> and I can't remember what it was. So for some reason, I texted you, texted Michelle, about something. Or she texted me, I can't remember, whatever. And I told her, I said, do you want to know what I'm doing right this moment? And she probably would have said, oh, no, don't tell me. But no, I said, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the bathroom because I can't quit crying and I don't cry pretty you ever see people that cry pretty there's some people that just cry pretty and they just you know they just look so pretty and nice you know nothing their face don't get all red they don't their eyes don't get all bloodshot whatever they don't have snot coming out of every orifice they got there's some people that just cry pretty it's like it doesn't faze them I don't get that whenever I cry that doesn't happen it ain't pretty Debbie so I went to the bathroom and I just had to con had to just sort of you know get myself back in shape and order a little bit, and I went back and sit down at my desk and I began to work again. And there was a customer that come in and everything. I thought, okay, you know, let's let's get back to what we're doing. So I started listening to the music again, and then God come again. What happened? I had to get up and go back to the bathroom. And <laughs> that's what I said, Sarah. Well. <laughs> But all that day, God kept showing me the evidence of how he's worked and how he's done. And tonight, I just want to ask you, what is your evidence that God is working? You know, I hear so much, and just think about this for a second. How often do you hear Satan getting the praise for what he does? Oh, he's working, he's, he's working overtime, he's doing this, and he's coming against God's people, and he's working, 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 working. And then we just leave it at that. I am sick and tired of hearing about Satan and what he's doing. And I want to hear about God and what he's doing. I want to hear the evidence. I want to see the evidence of what he's doing. So I begin to think about the evidence that God has shown me. And here's some things that I wrote down that I have seen with my own eyes. In a jail ministry, I got to sit down knee to knee with a prisoner that was there in jail. We were in small groups. We were having a jail ministry, and we were seeing at the time about 30. It could be from 30 to 50-some guys in a small room that was definitely smaller than just this section right here, maybe about half that section. And there was times that would just be standing room only. That night, the guy that was leading the jail ministry had a... At the time, I didn't think he was very wise, but he said, he said, we're going to divide into small groups. So we had like maybe five or six of us that were there from the church that we were doing the jail ministry. And, and he said, I want, you know, divide up as many as you can amongst the leaders that are here. So I had, I don't know, maybe seven or eight. And I was all the way in the very back of the room. And mind you, I'm in the back corner and the door is up in the front on the right I can't get to it if I had to for anything okay so I'm knee to knee with this guy that's sitting in front of me and there's these other guys around me and we start talking and we start sharing and this guy that's sitting in front of me starts sharing why he's there and he got caught by a Tennessee state trooper and his former job what he would do he was hired to kill people and when he started unloading all this out, I immediately look at the door and I think, God, there's no way I could get there in time to get out if he gets mad or something goes wrong. 
So you take control. You just have it. Of course, you know, Satan just starts working. You get these thoughts in your head, you know. And so in that moment, he starts sharing. He said that a Tennessee State Trooper pulls him over. He has a girl in the car that is the girlfriend of the guy that's in his truck, a trunk. And he's on his way to go kill the guy. And so he's supposed to, his job was when he kills the guy, he's supposed to kill the girl that's in the car. Because there can't be anybody that's left that knows what's, what's happening. You know how it goes. You've seen enough movies. You, you get that, right? All right. So he is going down the road, all intentions of doing the job that he was hired to carry out. He gets pulled over by a Tennessee State Trooper. And he begins to, he looks up and he looks at me eye to eye. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. And tears start flowing out of his eyes. And he said, I have never been more happy to see a cop pull me over. He said, I couldn't say that then. He said, then, he said, I wanted to kill him. He said, because he was getting in the way of what I was supposed to do. But he said, because he busted me there, because he pulled me over. He said, it put me into a journey he said that brought me to this place to that jail at that moment and I seen this killer and I forget how many people he even told us how many people he had killed before whether that's true or not I don't know but he, he I, I watched him as he was sharing about his former life and I watched in that moment with me and these other eight guys these other inmates sitting around and I watched this killer get transformed by God and just turn into a puddle of mush. I mean, this, this big, bad, hardened guy that has seen stuff that I'll never see, that has done stuff that I'll never do, that would just turn your stomach, sits there, and he starts talking about how God has been speaking to him. And it turns into a conversation with all of us, and we end up gathering around him, put our hands on him and praying over him, and he gets transformed at that moment and gets saved gets up from that point, that place, and shouting. And I mean, you're talking about a guy shouting. I mean, he just let it rip. And that whole place exploded. That's one thing. I've seen the evidence of God. Another one is I've seen a man who was dealing with demonic forces and issues and stuff, and he was doing it. He come from a home that was not good, not raised by his own mom and dad, but someone else that took him in, and they were dealing with witchcraft and different things. From him being a young boy, he come up with it, and he had so much junk, baggage. We talked about last week how we had the baggage that we carried. This guy had baggage. But he also practiced certain things. He would take pictures of dead people and do certain rituals that I'm not going to go any further and explain because you don't need to know. But he would do certain things, and he showed me. He, he invited me over to his house one day. And he said he wanted me to come and pray because he said he was dealing with all these, these things. And... I went over to the house and I prayed with him. He began to show me this stuff. And I told him, I said, man, you've got to get this stuff out. You've got to get as far away from it as you can get. Separate yourself from it. But then I went to pray over him. And at that moment, that night, he got up shouting and he pushed me out the door. And he told me, he said, I can't, he said you can't stay here anymore. He said, if, if you stay here, he said, these voices, these demons are telling me to kill you. He said, get out, leave, and he pushed me out. He, he called me another time, and he was just, just frantic and just almost seemed like he was losing his mind in a panic. And there was another pastor there in Monticello, a young guy, and, and he had called him as well. We both showed up about the same time. When I got there, he was already there, and he was just in a rage. And the other young man, the uh, young pastor, left, Tried to talk to him, tried to pray with him, tried to do everything he could to reason with him, and he was just wasn't going to have it. The devil had a grip on him, and he was not about to let go at that moment. And I tried to do something, he just started chucking bottles at me. And he came up behind me, he just shoved me out the door. And I stood there on the porch, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, I said, you've got you to do something. You've got to do something. Well, at that moment, nothing happened. But I kept praying for him, I kept praying for him, and, and kept interceding for him we would prayed for him and he went down a road that was not good for some time and then he calls me what 
three or four months ago he calls me out of the blue and I hear his voice on the other end of the phone at first it scared me because I remember the last few times I dealt with him I knew what he was going through his marriage wasn't good he wasn't good he wasn't in a good place but when I heard his voice on the phone that day it was different and he called and he said man he said I just need to apologize to you for what I did to you he said I need to confess some things and he said I just want to tell you he said that God has got a hold of me and he said change me we had this conversation over the phone and I've seen him since then he's now actually working with kids in Monticello Nazarene Church and he's just like, just like a little he's like a little child his, his heart is so sweet and so loving toward these kids and toward other people to where at once it was bound up with nothing but evil satanic stuff and all he could hear and deal with was, was demonic voices and different things that was going on inside of him and I've seen God take him and transform him I've seen the evidence of that and he's totally different I've seen God take me in my own life the things that I've dealt with and right now what I want you to think about is I want you to think about what God has done in you because I'm going to ask you here in a second okay but God has taken me and he has transformed me from a person who at one time was so angry that I found myself in a pawn shop buying a gun because I wanted to go blow somebody's head off going through a divorce that just totally wrecked me and I'll, I'll just be honest I, I wasn't in the right frame of mind I wasn't but I was eat up with anger bitterness I was not in a good place but I've seen God take the person that I was then and totally transform me into a totally different person I've seen him take a person that used to be addicted to pornography sexual things and I, I wanted to feed that lust and that desire to now I don't want any part of it I don't desire that, that those lustful things I don't desire those things I desire to see God glorified and I desire to see people be changed through him I desire to see him do in other people what I know that he's done in me because I've seen the evidence of it there used to be a time you couldn't get me up here behind a pulpit you couldn't get me up in front of people you couldn't have got me in a jail in a confined room with 40 50 other guys witnessing and ministering to them and even at sometimes nobody hold me to this leading worship singing and leading worship in front of them never thought I'd do that in front of about 40 or 50 guys but I've seen how God has taken me and transformed me in my own life I've seen the things that he's done in me and family members and other people that's been around me not because of me or anything I've done it's all because of him it's all because of him I am so tired of hearing what the devil does and that he's hard at work and that he's working overtime and that he's doing this and he's doing that and he's just ravaging people and he's destroying this and doing that and I want to hear tonight from you the evidence of God in your life so here in a second I'm going to ask for some people to testify see here's the thing Elisha seen it and he could have kept it to himself but he didn't but he allowed and he prayed for his servant his eyes to be open and to see it if we just keep it all to ourselves, and we never testify to the goodness of God we never testify what he can do if we never testify y'all remember last Sunday night right and I don't know if any of y'all have been up here and seen any of these papers and you read them but I'll tell you it's heartbreaking to read some of those papers on that cross and that's why they're still here but it's heartbreaking to see some of the burdens and some of the things that we have been carrying and I hope and I pray that when you put them on this cross and you left it here I hope that you left it in God's hands and you didn't take it back with you but I want to hear from you about the evidence of God young people kids I want somebody to stand up and testify teens I want somebody to stand up and testify what have you seen how have you seen God work today just today when we showed up at the pastor's house that's church that's church family to me that's seeing the evidence of God at work real life today this morning you come in, con come in contact with a homeless man 
right? On the corner wherever had a sign, ended up bringing him to church with you. By yourself, I might add, right? Just by yourself. A lot of people say, well, she should have done that. You know what? She did what she felt like God told her to do, right? Right. Brought him to church. He sat back there in service. And after the service was over, me and Matt drove him to Somerset. He's looking for his family. He's trying to get to Somerset. So we drove him. We got to talk to him. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but he said that him being here today in this service, that there was something about it, right? And I believe with all my heart that God used that. He used you to get him here so that he could hear the truth this morning. I've seen God at work. I've seen him evidence. I've seen the evidence of what he can do.